So hi, I'm Carol Kircho, the founder of ART Compass, which is a mobile application for IBF labs for uh, basically information management coming from your IVF laboratory. It helps your patients see their embryos and it helps you have all of the information related to their cycles. We have a whole suite of quality control tools for IVF labs and we're basically just helping IVF practices digitize and step into the 21st century with their information technologies. And I'm here today with Dr. Vanna Kashani and we're going to talk about PGT and PGT technologies, all sorts of, of things related to PGT. So Dr. Kashani is an REI at Eden Fertility Centers, and I'd love for you to just say a few words about yourself now. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Kircho. Um, obviously, ART Compass is a, a great utility to consider for your IVF practice, and I'm excited that we are going to chat about pre-implantation genetic testing. I am a board-certified OBGYN and a reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist at Eden Centers for Advanced Fertility in Newport Beach. I'm a native of Orange County, so happily moved back here to be able to practice and take care of patients in my community. Um, my top priority is obviously patient care. It's what I enjoy, what I love, what drives me. And I always love to figure out what's the latest and greatest in technology, anything and everything that we can do to you know, improve success for patients struggling with their fertility journey. So excited to talk to you about genetic testing. It's a controversy in our field. It's ever changing, it's ever evolving. So, um, so it's a nice topic. So before we dig into that, you mentioned that you are building a world-class practice right here in Orange County in Newport Beach. And I know that you have a, a very large lab and all of the great, latest and greatest new technologies. And if, if there was anything that you wanted to say about that, about the brand new practice, we'd love to hear about that too. So, you know, coming from different centers and different labs, it really is important to emphasize the importance of an embryology lab. There's only so much, you know, we can achieve as a physician with, um, you know, creating protocols for patients. The lab and our embryologists are key. And I've noticed a significant improvement in patient pregnancy rates just because of the quality and build of the lab. The, you know, air purification systems, the technology, the obviously skill of our embryologist has really demonstrated in a short period of time um, some excellent success rates. So it's exciting to be part of you know, a new, new center and um, exciting to see that all of the efforts collectively have paid off thus far and I'm sure we're just gonna continue to do well. Well, that's so exciting. It's so exciting to be able to really help patients in the community that you come from. And mm -hmm. you know, I know that so I'm also a clinical embryologist and board certified technical supervisor in embryology. And so one of the things that we have in common from the clinical side and the lab side is this pre-implantation genetic testing. And of course that is tied in so much with the skill of your embryologist, like you were saying, to perform these microsurgical biopsies. Sure. But let's start off with just the basics. Let's talk about the different types of, there's PGT, there's PGD, and what what those can and can't do for our patients. Sure, sure. So in general, you know, when patients go through IVF, just as a very brief um, update, you know, they're having eggs um, that are stimulated within their ovaries, they're retrieved, and in the laboratory, our skilled embryologists will be performing fertilization through ICSI, and we'll watch these embryos grow. And nowadays, most um, embryos are going to be cultured to the blastocyst stage. And we have the utility of technology to actually biopsy some of the cells that um, are part of the trophectoderm that can then be analyzed for genetic testing. And there's different types of genetic testing in different companies um, that are available and each have their own, you know, updated technologies. Most recently, most centers are using next generation sequencing um, to be able to get the most accurate results from those two samples of cells that we're able to collect. And you can do general screening or testing of embryos to look for things like aneuploidy. Does the embryo have 46 chromosomes, 23 of each derived from each um, parent? or is there an abnormal number of chromosomes and what is that abnormality? 
Um, and then obviously there's something called PGTM, which is looking at monogenetic diseases. And if there is a particular gene mutation that you know, makes their offspring susceptible for a condition like cystic fibrosis, then obviously you can screen embryos prior. So it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. amazing what we can do and the, the technology has advanced significantly. Yeah, so you mentioned cystic fibrosis and I think it, that is um, such a big problem for my background is French Canadian and it's so prevalent in, in the French Canadian um, genome. And it's, I know there's, you know, several other um, different heritages where it's much more common than others. And so it is so important, especially in this area where we have a lot of, of, of individuals who have these genetic backgrounds that can predispose them to cystic fibrosis and Tay-Sachs disease and some of these other single gene mutations that we can be testing for. So from my perspective, from the lab side, I always explain it to my, my patients like, like this. So we have to um, get half of the genes from the mother and half of the genes from the father. And sometimes the sperm or the egg can be carrying either too much or too little of what it needs. And so I always like to bring people all the way back to biology 101. Yeah. Maybe they had it. You have to. You have to. It's so complex. And mitosis. And so meiosis, the specialized kind of cell division that eggs and sperm undergo. And us but women, we have our eggs sitting in our ovaries for many years before we sometimes decide to reproduce. And as the eggs are sitting there, I think most people probably don't know this, but it's actually all of the, the whole complement of genomes are still together inside that egg. It doesn't actually start dividing up those chromosomes and kicking them out until it starts to undergo maturation during the stem cycle. And then even further, not the very last package of chromosomes to get kicked out to half the chromosomes happens when we actually inject the sperm into the egg. So everything we do to those eggs after we collect them has to be done in a very special, highly controlled environment. So we control the humidity, the temperature, the pH, and essentially what we're trying to do is make it so that that mechanism that goes in and pulls the chromosomes apart to the opposite sides of the cell, um, the, the mechanism is not affected by the temperature or the pH at all. So we're trying to actually replicate what is it like inside the human body, inside the environment of a fallopian tube. And that's part of the job of the embryologist is to make sure that the environment is stable and that those eggs or sperm are treated so delicately so that nothing happens to the DNA as on its way toward becoming an embryo and becoming a blastocyst. So, no, I love the way you say that. I mean, it's so important to understand what a delicate structure these eggs are and how refined that process of division is and, you know, how critical it is. So, yeah. And so another thing that I think a lot of people want to know is who do you recommend get genetic testing of their embryos? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think that this is going to vary between um, REI or fertility physicians or providers. So even um, myself, really, I quickly adopted genetic testing in my practice um, when I came out of fellowship and pretty much offered it to most patients. And I did that because obviously I wanted the best success rates for all of my patients. And it really was demonstrated that if you have a genetically normal embryo and it's been screened prior, then take that embryo, put it inside the uterus, and the success rate will be high on the order of 70% or more um, for implantation. Mm -hmm. However, with time, I did alter my practice slightly um, and I did start to reevaluate the situation and individualize things um, for my patients. And so more recently, my um, recommendation for PGT is very, very individualized. So I can't tell you just straight off the bat, this is what I do. But typically, I'll, I'll explain it. So if a woman is, you know, on the order of the age of 35 or older, then I think that it is a something to consider. And that's because as women age, 
their ovaries obviously have eggs that have been around, as you stated, for many, many more years. They're more prone to environmental insults, and obviously we know that egg quality is lower. So they're higher risk of having an embryo that could have aneuploidy. In women younger than 35 or younger than 30, I, I tend to more and more steer away from advising genetic testing, especially in women less than 30. I think the utility of that is um, dependent on that patient because of the fact that more than likely they will have a genetically normal embryo. We can select based off of morphology. Mm -hmm. um, again, you have to individualize things because if somebody has a history of recurrent pregnancy loss and has had multiple miscarriages and they're 32, of course I'm gonna advise consideration for genetic testing. Likewise, if somebody is 40 and I know that they're only gonna maybe have one blastocyst and that's their only chance of transfer and previously they'd done IVF and had all aneuploid embryos and just want the ability to transfer one embryo, then you know you can forego doing genetic testing as long as the patient is counseled appropriately ahead of time. So That's such a good uh, nuanced um, explanation of how you, would, how you would recommend PGT to your patients. And I think, you know, from the lab side, one of the things that we always um, talk about is if you have a very strong gender preference, yeah. then no matter what your age is, you're going to want to get that. Right. But um, I would say that probably about 80 to 90 percent of patients that I see undergo PGP and and sort of. Um, but I know that, you know, one of the things <clears throat> that is really important is obviously the history of the patient and that chance of, of undergoing reoccurrent pregnancy loss. And so that kind of also brings us to our next point is, I know that there was this large um, trial, multi-center trial, yes. where there were so many people participating because we wanted to see as a field overall if PGT was raising the um, pregnancy rates right. and that was called the star trial and in the star trial the results that came back out of it were a little conflicting and a little bit what we didn't expect to see and I think from my perspective in the lab side what it tended to do was um, really gloss over the differences between labs and protocols and um, perhaps quality and different types of biopsy and you know different types of the PGT testing what the different platforms were because right. PGT testing you, you mentioned um, next-gen sequencing and there are all different companies that perform PGT testing and so I think it's a weird thing of statistics but when you start lumping together a lot of data you can sort of um, dilute down there's yeah, awesome. yeah and really just complicate the results because the number of inputs that you need to get a good output becomes so exponential so if you wanted to look at pgt across all of those centers and protocols and different platforms to do the testing with i think the, the trial probably really needed a lot more input data um, to like approximate that curve of significance. And, and of course, more control, because as you said, I mean, there's so much variation in the labs, potentially there's variation in the tech biopsy technique. And maybe in a certain lab that, you know, the biopsy technique could have actually had an impact on the embryo post thaw, and that's where the implantation rate could have been affected. I mean, there's so many considerations. So it's great to have a randomized multi-center controlled trial, this is like our gold standard, but in certain circumstances that actually makes it hard to really look at the data appropriately because um, there's just so many variances. And also, as you said, the different companies that were used for the genetic testing um, may have had different, you know, characterization of what's constituted as normal versus abnormal. So, and then you have this middle gray zone of mosaic embryos, which have some abnormalities and some normal you know, cells. So what, what pushes one company to call something normal? What pushes another company called abnormal? And is there really a significant difference? So I think that it's, it's, it's always more complicated, always. Like it's yeah. nothing that simple. But I did love that the trial did happen. 
I do love that, you know, it was published in, you know, obviously a journal that all of us read, Fertility and Sterility, mm -hmm. and it really opened a discussion to just take a step back and reevaluate things. Because um, I think that across the board, there are a lot of people that are just offering PGT, freeze all cycles, every single patient that walks in the door, and that's okay. But I don't find that one size fits all approach really is the best approach. And I think that this, you know, trial really made all of us as providers just take a step back and look and try to individualize things for the patient. Because in the end, if we can do things with a less invasive approach without doing biopsy, then, you know, that's that's not only beneficial, hopefully, for the embryos and post-thaw, but maybe, you know, cost-wise, it's a savings for somebody who may not need that extra technology. That's such a good point. And so I want to go back to one thing that you mentioned. You started talking about mosaic embryos a little bit. Sure, yes. And I think, and we also said, we said aneuploid and euploid a lot while we were talking. And so let's just define those for our patients who might be listening yeah. and not know, like maybe they're just coming to PGT for the first time. So a euploid em embryo has a normal number of chromosomes. An aneuploid embryo has an abnormal number of chromosomes. And a mosaic embryo means that the biopsy that we took has some cells that have a normal number and some cells that have an abnormal number. And from, the, from, from my side of the bench, <clears throat> I always describe an embryo to my patients like a soccer ball. Mm -hmm. It has spots of black. Love that and white. analogy. Yeah, and, those, and it can have spots of normal cells and abnormal cells. And if we take the biopsy from one full color, it might look it might look like a false um, false negative or a false positive, and if sure. we take it from the border, it can it can come back as a mosaic embryo. And so I think what you said about the testing companies is exactly correct. Um, the size of the biopsy also matters so much. So if you have one of the testing companies, I know has a limit of twenty percent of abnormality to okay. be as the lower limit. And the upper limit is like 70% abnormality. So it's, it's kind of interesting because that depends on the size of the biopsy you take. One and cell- Typically, can you tell? Five. Yeah. You can, can tell, tell if you're like getting enough of a biopsy when you do things, like you're, you feel comfortable. Yeah, we can see the exact number of cells that we're taking. So I, I think a good biopsy size is between eight and 10 cells. And that's going to give our patients also the best chance of having either a normal embryo or a mosaic embryo, because you can have, you know, at that point, you can start to have a lot of those cells be abnormal out of, out of eight cells. Exactly. But if you take a four cell biopsy and one of those cells is abnormal, then you're going to start to push the embryo into territory where they don't recommend transferring it. Right. So it's, it's definitely you know, like we were talking about, is so dependent on the um, skill of the person actually doing the biopsy. So the biopsy is um, actually a micro surgery that we perform with a robot yeah. to, to pluck off just a few cells That's off the of guy, 150 cell blastocyst. And it really takes a lot of skill. It's one of the procedures that you learn last as an embryologist and after you fill up all of your other skill sets. So from the clinician side, um, w like when you're thinking about ranking embryos for transfer, you obviously want to transfer and prioritize those normal embryos first. But right. if the patient only has mosaic embryos or, or abnormal embryos, do you transfer abnormals and do you transfer mosaics? And how do you think about them in your in your day-to-day -day practice? You know, in my day-to-day -day practice, I've never transferred to abnormal. Um, I don't necessarily advise that patients have to discard those embryos, but I personally have not completed a transfer to abnormal. Um, I have considered transferring mosaic embryos with a lot of extensive counseling and consideration. And it really depends on, again, the level of mosaicism, looking at the technology in the lab and what they're calling, you know, mosaic versus abnormal, and looking at the other factors, right? Um, and these factors include what, looking at the morphology of the embryo itself um, to see if that has any bearing, and then coming back to, can this patient go through another 
cycle, an alter cycle, accumulate more embryos? Or is this somebody who's using, you know, oocytes that they froze prior to chemotherapy because they had breast cancer? And this is their only one shot of being able to treat these people. Obviously, the considerations vary. So uh, again, I try to individualize each of those um, components. I haven't transferred abnormal. There are centers that are doing studies where they will accept patients and they will transfer abnormal embryos or mosaic embryos readily. Like for example, Stanford, I know readily is enrolling patients for that. Um, so there, you know, it doesn't mean if you've only gone through and you only have abnormal or mosaic embryos that you, you have no chance, but we, it has to be done with extreme caution. There's been plenty of babies reported to be born completely normal and healthy from, you know, genetically mosaic embryos or even some abnormal. So there is always the possibility. To, and so it, it, it's just important to consider that discussion with your, your provider. Sure. So the, from what I understand, the fully abnormal embryos that have resulted in healthy pregnancies could have been um, called that with earlier technologies than what we're using now. And right. that those that don't distinguish between mosaics and non-mosaics. Yes. But from what I understand from some recent work that's been done in the field, when a biopsy is completely abnormal, it matches the inner cell mass. So maybe maybe I should back up a step and talk about Yeah, let's let's not track and explain yes. the so two we, components. When we take our biopsy in the lab, we don't want to damage the embryo exactly like we were talking about. So we take a few cells from the trophectoderm layer, which is the layer of cells around the embryo that becomes the placenta. We don't want to touch the inner cell mass, which is the part that becomes the embryo proper. And so the, the thought sometimes has been, well, maybe the cells that go to form the placenta are not reflective of the embryo as a whole. Um, but I think some recent work has shown that when the biopsy is fully abnormal, that does match the inner cell mass all the way and is also fully abnormal. So I think when patients are searching Google searching and they're reading some of these things, they should take that with a grain of salt because it was probably with earlier technologies. That yes, again, definitely open the discussion with your providers so they can help kind of navigate you through your particular case because you know, making an assumption based on something else that was put out there on Google potentially that affected someone else may not pertain to your case. So, absolutely. And so, in general, um, do you think when a patient, when patients in general um, undergo a cycle, you know, they can they can have, let's say, twelve eggs, eight of them make it to blastocyst, and six of them could come back abnormal. Why are there so many abnormal? embryos in a cycle that come from a cohort of eggs? Is there? If, if I could answer that question perfectly, <laughs> I would be doing so much better. No, um, I think that it is so, so multifactorial and it's probably the hardest, hardest discussion to have with patients because it's devastating, right? Like we always try to predict hopefully 50% are going to be normal, 50% abnormal, obviously it varies based on age, but when you have circumstances that come back, and you're getting a lower euploid rate or normal rate than expected, it's, it's challenging. You know, some of the things that I've thought about are um, the fact that, you know, underlying conditions that can impact um, euploidy rate. Obviously, age is really important. The older age will always have a higher rate of aneuploidy. But other things like a uh, history of endometriosis mm -hmm. could have an impact potentially um, that I think is not really well measured or studied, but a consideration. And there could be, you know, some significance of the lab that potentially has, you know, an impact. The protocol, there is some information that, you know, higher use of gonadotropins, very, very high stimulation protocols can be contributing to blastocysts, higher number of eggs retrieved, but is that affecting the actual, you know, chromosomal complement within the egg? And is that downstream having an effect on these body rates? It's still to be determined. I, I, I don't think we really know for sure. Yeah. And it's a matter of what can we do or examine for that particular case to optimize those cells for one cycle. So we're always pulling things out of the box to try a different protocol, try this supplement, this antioxidant, you know, all these different things that we're trying um, because we really, and it, it'll vary. No two things will work for the same patient as well. So. 
And have you seen patients go from having a cycle that has maybe all abnormals to having another cycle that has yes. normals to transfer? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's always a surprise. And I, I'll never forget one of those cases I had when I was a fellow. It was shocking to see somebody have four out of four abnormals, devastated young patient, and then go through again. And I think she got five blasts before we're normal in the second cycle. So I always tell people it's, it's like tossing a coin. So we expect things to be maybe 50-50, heads, tails, alternating. But you know very well you can have a situation or circumstance where you get tails four times in a row, and then you get your heads, which is, you know, you play. So it, it just, if you get enough embryos eventually, I think it'll equate itself. But it's absolutely devastating when you have a cycle and all are abnormal. And so do you know, and I'm, I, maybe, maybe you do or don't know, and I don't know anything special about this. I'm just going to throw it out there, but sure. is, there any, is there any evidence for any um, connection between insulin metabolism and sensitivity and, and conditions like PCOS and the number of normal or abnormal embryos? I think it's been investigated. I honestly haven't looked at the most recent studies, but I know that it's been investigated because it's always surprising that in some women with PCOS, you know, they have such a high cohort number of eggs, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have a high euploidy rate or normal rate. So, you know, the, is that a, because of the androgenic environment that, you know, they're exposed to from PCOS? Is it due to something related to hyperinsulinemia or you know something related to higher sugar levels? It, I think we're still just trying to piece together the puzzle, but I haven't looked at the most updated literature, so maybe there's more definitive um, information. Yeah, that. I haven't seen anything new for a while, but I was just yeah. wondering if you knew anything about it. So, um, well, is there anything else that you would want your patients to know about PGT or um, genetic well, testing of embryos or? Biopsy. Yeah, I mean, I think that I want to know from your perspective, you know, doing these biopsies and these procedures, there's always this consideration, well, is embryo manipulation even safe, right? And I, we tried, you know, we do know it's safe and thousands of babies have been born healthy, but um, do you think that's something that someone should strongly consider? Let's say, you know, they, they really want to do genetic testing for gender, for example, but they're terrified of the effects that it can have on their embryo. How would you tell them? Because you're the one back there, you know, performing these. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, again, it's so dependent on the center that you go to. It really just depends on the skill of the person doing the biopsy. Sure. Um, when you start to tug the embryo apart, you're holding it on one edge by the zona pellucida, that membrane around the embryo, and you're, and you're tugging the embryo. So you're putting sheer forces, just physical mechanical forces as you are gripping the embryo and, and pulling those cells off of it. And then we use a laser, um, a powerful laser to fire in between those cell junctions to get that piece to separate off, causing as little damage to the cells around it as possible. But this is a type, you know, the biopsy technique itself has evolved over the years and it is still evolving. So one of the newest techniques that they have um, available is called the flick biopsy. And what you do is you line up your two tools so that one is right underneath and you suck to the cells into your needle and then you flick it past the top and that breaks the piece off without really using the laser on the embryo too much. So you have to be very highly skilled to do it you, so that you don't destroy the embryo in the flipping process. I have tried it a couple times on um, animal model embryos and it's, it's, it is very hard to get used to, but I've heard that when, when people become proficient at that technique, the pregnancy rates from it are even better. Interesting. And so it's, it is a question, is the laser doing something to the embryo? Or is it just that act of pulling the embryo alone? Um, is it the time that the embryo spends out of the incubator while it's getting biopsy before we put it back? So we have to use a special media to, um, well, I shouldn't say we have to because people again do this all different ways, but some people use a special media that helps the embryo stay within a certain pH outside the incubator. 
And then okay. you take it out of that media and you put it back into media that's good for the inside of the incubator. And so that in and of itself is also a question. Is the type of media that you're putting the embryo into outside of the incubator causing any effect? Right. So, so I, many variables. So, many, so variables. many variables. And so then I also think, you know, one of the things that's being studied a lot now by all of these different companies, there's two different things. One is, can we use artificial intelligence to determine the normalcy of an embryo? Right. Can we take a bunch of pictures of the embryo, run it through an AI system and get a result back like this is normal or abnormal? And I think they're even starting to ask, can we do specific uh, disorders like Down syndrome just by looking at images of the embryo? Wow. There's yeah. some good data on that. And also what people really want to know a lot of times is the gender of the embryo. So right. I think that's another question that artificial intelligence is trying to answer right now. So that's what we would refer to as a non-invasive way to screen the embryo. And there's a couple of non-invasive biopsy techniques as well. So instead of taking cells off the edge of the embryo, we can actually insert the needle into the inside of the embryo and take some of the fluid out of the cavity. And we can do that with relatively little damage. And so people are studying, um, is that maybe even a better indicator of the normalcy of the embryo because you're getting cells from all around the inside of the body, it's not just from that perfected arm layer. Yeah. And then another thing is this media that the embryos are cultured in, can we take a little bit of that media and test it for um, cell-free DNA or um, DNA that's floating in the media and see if we can determine um, the, the status of the embryo through that way. So I think these biopsy techniques are, you know, again, like our whole field is only 40 years, I mean, 40 years old, right? It's so the much biopsy. quickly. It's yep. hard to keep up. It does, which is why it's so important that we all get to go to meetings together and talk and discuss yeah. all the scientific results. So it's been an interesting. So it, it, it'll be exciting to see, you know, with in the next five years, how these non-invasive technologies could potentially be more utilized if they are actually validated to be helpful. So it, it'll be, that's something to look forward to definitely in the next five to 10 years. Would you say you agree? I totally agree. Absolutely. And I look forward to someday, you know, being part of that research as well. So I have done a little bit of that research in the past, um, particularly wow. with AI and with non-invasive biopsy. Um, and um, now we're using artificial intelligence inside of our application. Oh. And so that's it, amazing. Yeah, it, it has been pretty amazing. But of course, the AI systems themselves are all still in development. So okay. it's, yeah, these are all developing things that are developing together. But well, it was really nice to chat with you about PGT. Yeah. I hope that we can have clarified some things that patients ask a lot about and maybe even given them new things to think about. It's sure. so maybe you got even more confused potentially because yeah. it's it, it is a confusing topic and it just and it, it requires a lot of research and discussion and so um i think what i would say to most people is ask questions do your own research because you know the more information you have you can potentially make the best decision for your case and absolutely it's so refreshing to hear a physician say that you know what this nuanced very patient centered approach that you take to counseling your patients and it's not just a one size fits all model and it's it's so nice to hear that because i know you know patients want to be treated like individuals like the individuals they are they don't um, i mean and there's going to be things that are going to help one person that will not help someone else so again it's your job to speak up and you know discuss your concerns and your goals and objectives and what's important to you and i i mean i would say would you be open to patients asking you you know direct questions about your skill and your expertise and your thoughts i mean do you ever talk to patients directly about that i do so i try always to talk in a general sense and not anything like specific to sure. you know <laughs> And in, in general, like, we always have to keep it as an educational thing and, like, you're not really giving advice. But I do encourage everybody to reach out to me on either the Med Answers platform, where I'm an expert on okay. answering patients' questions there, um, the Fertility Answers platform, and or also, you know, on social media. And I know you're really active on social media, too, and directly connecting to your patients, so yeah. I'm sure you're 
doing some of the same things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm so glad we had a chance to collaborate on this. And um, I hope to be able to talk about more interesting topics related to infertility and embryology in the future. Absolutely. I think I know one of the things that people ask me about a lot is ERA testing. And oh, yes. And the <laughs> questions. So maybe we can have sure. a follow up where yes. we can yes, yes, yes. all about the endometrium. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll have a great afternoon. You too. Oh,